Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime episode. I am so happy that you are here. I am so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of 29-year-old Ashley Erhart. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. Now, before we get into the details of today's video, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Aura. Now, I want to start this off with a question for you. And the question is this, have you ever Googled your name or the name of somebody you know, somebody you love, and found that there was a lot of yours or their personal information on one of those public listing sites? That is because it is far more common for your personal information to get out on the internet or out into the world. And that is because there are these things, these people, these companies called data brokers who make a ton of money by taking your personal information and selling it to people that you really don't want to have it, like spammers and robocallers, okay? They can even find out where you live. I am not down with that sickness. I value my privacy and I value your privacy, and that is why I want to introduce you to Aura. Did you know that data brokers are legally required to take off your information if you ask them to? Sounds great, right? except they make it super difficult for you. They make it almost impossible for you to find out which data brokers have your information, and that is where Aura comes in. They identify which of those pesky data brokers have your information, and then they submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They do the work so that you do not have to. When I first signed up for Aura, one of the very first things, actually the very first thing that I did was went to the section, the data broker opt-out section, because I was like, okay, how many of these brokers really had my information? And it turns out 30. 30 and Aura had already submitted opt-out requests for me, like on my behalf, which thank you, Aura. They also see if your information has been leaked on the dark web and nobody wants your information to be leaked on the dark web. They see if your passwords that you use for things online, like I don't know, banking, they see if those are strong. They check all of these things to help keep you safe online that really I feel like people don't think about enough and they're very important. Aura just really does the most to protect you and your family from online threats that you just simply cannot see. Through just the Aura app, which is super easy to set up, you can get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. And you get it all in one place. You don't need several different apps to do these things, and you get it all at one affordable price. It sounds great to me, but listen, I'm not your mom. I can't tell you what to do, but what I can say is that I don't want people to exploit you and private off of your personal information and you don't have to let that happen. You can let Aura do all the hard work for you, like keeping you safe online. And of course, I have great news for you today. Aura is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to explore all they have to offer for free for two weeks through the link in my description box. So if all that sounds as good to you as it does to me, make sure to click the link in my description box, which is aura.com slash Bratterstein to get a 14 day free trial and see if your personal information has been leaked online. And if it has, let Aura help you put a stop to it today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Aura for being a continued being a continued, continuing to be a sponsor to this channel. It's sponsors like Aura that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that is presently in the news. Well, actually, let me back that up. It is not. It was in the news. It was being heavily reported on when Ashley was first killed. But since then, it is sort of faded from people's attention, from the media's attention. And I feel like it is such a shame because it is horrible. What happened to this woman is horrible and she left behind two kids a boy and a girl who are both under the age of five or at least were under the age of five when this murder took place and for whatever reason nobody's talking about it anymore and it's and it's just it makes me so upset because like she was stolen from these kids and from the lives of all the people who loved her by an asshole let's call it what it is and it happened right before she was about to move on to a new chapter in her life where things could have been so much better for her so today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details. But of course, I want you to answer once you have something to go on. But the question of the day is this. I actually have two. One, what do you believe? 
happened? Well, actually, I guess it is just one question with like multiple parts. What do you believe happened to Ashley? Like, what do you believe sparked this violent murder? And what do you think her killer is going to try to say to defend himself? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. And now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Ashley Erhardt. And it is worth mentioning right off the bat that all of this, well not all of this, but a lot of this is alleged, right? Because Ashley was killed and somebody has been arrested, but he hasn't gone to trial, so it is believed by the general public that he is responsible and it was believed by the police department that he was responsible, obviously, because they arrested him, but he is innocent until proven guilty, so, you know, for legal purposes or whatever. Not like anyone's going to stumble upon this video, you know what I mean? I'm just a little small potatoes kind of lady, but just in case, you know, you know, you know. Our story today begins at 10.40 a.m., and this is on September 22nd, 2023, and it starts with a text message, and this case has a lot of of text messages that we're going to work through. But this particular text message was from a girl and she was sending it to her brother. And the text just said, quote, where the are you? Now this text was sent to a man named John Wonder. This, the, this girl, her brother's name was John Wonder and John was seemingly missing. He had dropped his two kids off at his in-laws house that morning, like he always did. This was a very routine thing before leaving and heading presumably for work, but he never showed up. So his boss, being concerned at his absence, decided to call the police and request a welfare check because they were that concerned that something may be going on. So the boss, again, called and asked police if they would do a welfare check at John's home. And his home was located at the 7900 block of North Forest Avenue near 79th Street in Kansas City, Missouri. So once word of the welfare check got out to people who knew them, family, things like that, obviously people were reasonably worried, which is why his sister had sent him a text. And to her surprise, she got a response. She was not expecting to get a response, so she was just sending it because like, that's what you do. People are trying to get a hold of him. But people had been trying to get a hold of John for like an hour prior to him finally responding to his sister. And to everyone's knowledge, he had not responded to anyone or nobody had spoken to him, but that turned out not to be true. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But the response, the response his sister received, though she was happy to hear from him and happy to know he was all right. His response definitely made her feel more concerned than she had when he was missing. I could only imagine because he responded to her saying, quote, Hey kiddo, sorry about the mess. For the record, it's way easier and much more satisfying than you can imagine. Which is cryptic as hell. But what he was actually referring to was even worse than anyone could have imagined. So the welfare check, it's just about 10.30 a.m. when police respond to said call and to perform said welfare check in. When they get to the house, they find that there are already people there. Family members are already at the house. There are three people there specifically. And these people were John Wonder's mother and also the parents of John's wife, the mother and father of John's wife, Ashley. So what had happened here was apparently, apparently, no, but apparently John wasn't the only person who didn't show up for work that day. So John and Ashley, they both work for the same company, but they work at different locations. So when John didn't show up for work at his location that morning, and then Ashley didn't show up for work at her location, management of the company was reasonably concerned. So they actually reached out not only to the police, but to Ashley's parents to see if they had heard from the couple or knew what was going on because they were concerned. Not only were they concerned because the couple hadn't shown up for work and that would already be unusual for them because it just wasn't in their character, but the management also knew that John and Ashley were in the midst of a separation. They were getting divorced, but they were still living together. So knowing that that could be a tense situation, they were rightfully concerned. So with that, Ashley's parents head over to the house. After receiving that call, they're like, okay, we need to head over right away. And it is worth mentioning that I don't know with 100% certainty if this was Ashley's mom and dad or Ashley's mom and stepdad, because from what I can see, it looks like her mother likely remarried. Maybe she just married her dad late in life. I don't know a hundred percent, but either way, this couple headed over to the house and shortly thereafter arrived, a rove, a roved. John's mom showed up too. And then so did the police, obviously, because they were going there for the welfare check. 
One of the first things Ashley's parents notice when they get to the house is that John's red sedan was parked in the garage. And they were like, oh, maybe he came home then instead of going to work because when he dropped off the kids at their house that morning, when he dropped off his kids at their, Ashley's parents' house that morning, they had seen him drive off in the red sedan. So they noted that that car was in the garage, but Ashley's car, which was a rented RAV4, was gone. So all these people, Ashley's parents, John's mom, the police, they're all outside talking, getting information. And Ashley's parents decide that they're just going to go inside the house. So they try to enter through an interior door, but they find that that door is chained locked from the inside. So they go around to the deck of the house and they enter through a sliding glass door. Now, it was only the family who went inside initially. The cops didn't go in with them at first. And I don't know exactly why that would be. They were there to do a particular job, which going into the house would be part of that job. I would think, but I'm not a doctor, you know, and maybe there's a liability thing that I don't understand. So it was just the family who went inside. And because it was just the family who went inside, Ashley's family was the one who discovered a scene that I could only imagine scarred them for the rest of their lives, man. This is going to be something that you can never unsee. While they were inside the house that John and Ashley had shared, they made their way down to the basement. And inside the basement, from the way I understand it, there is a laundry room and the door to the laundry room was slightly open. So they go to it and they try to open it, but they find that though it's open, it's held in place tightly with a bungee cord. By this time, police have already made it into the house. And from the way it's written, it sounds like they were still upstairs. But they hear that Ashley's either father or stepfather says to Ashley's mother, go upstairs. Then police come down and they find out why. Inside the basement, they found Ashley. And it was very clear to look at her that she was gone and that she had been gone a while. She was reportedly nude from the waist down. She had, quote, what appeared to be several puncture wounds to her left side with blood coming from the wounds, end quote, with a large butcher knife and meat cleaver located near her body. She had a belt around her neck. It was tightly around her neck. And on her leg, written in blood, there was one word, or rather one name. It simply said, wonder as in her husband, her soon-to-be ex-husband, John Wonder, and he was nowhere to be found. So now I want to talk about Ashley a little bit before going into the relationship and then moving forward with the case. And it is worth mentioning that again, this is a new case. This just happened at the end of last year, and there hasn't been a ton of reporting on it since it happened. So there isn't a ton of information out there. And as the case moves to a trial, things may become more clear and we might get a better picture of what happened and who Ashley was and who John was. But presently, I'm just going to tell you what I was able to dig up given what has been reported thus far. So Ashley, Ashley was 29 years old at the time that she was killed and she was a mom. She had two little babies. She had a four year old son and a two year old daughter. And she seemed to be very loved by those who knew her with her friends and family saying that she was a light that was taken from this earth far too soon. Her friends say that she was an amazing person with the warmest and most inviting heart that just radiated from her. And you can really see this in photos of her, her smile. She was incredibly beautiful and people who love her say that she was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. Her friend Irene said of her quote, everybody here is in mourning right now. I can't walk anywhere without meeting someone that's crying on my shoulder because she was that kind of person. So John and Ashley reportedly met and started dating in late 2016 to early 2017. And to look at them, you would have thought that they were happy, right? I mean, social media, we know, we know, even though when we were experiencing it, we, we forget, but we know social media is often a lie and photos that aren't candid can oftentimes be a lie. But to look at photos of them, you would think that they were happy and that they did love each other. And I mean, they definitely cared about each other at some point because they got together. They had their first child, a little boy who is absolutely precious, who we will call B. And then from there, they decided that, that this was for keeps, that they wanted this to be there forever. So in October of 2019, they got married. Ashley's family seemed to be happy or at least accepting of John after the two got married. Her mother posted like a congratulations, a congratulatory, I think that's a word, congratulatory post for the family, kind of accepting John into their fold, along with a photo of John and Ashley and B with a caption that said, quote, 
Introducing the Wonder Family, John, Ashley, and B. Wonder. So happy to have a new son-in-law. John and Ashley made it official in a private ceremony earlier this evening. B. is happy that his mommy and daddy are married. Following their marriage, they went on to have another child. This was an adorable little girl who was aggressively accepted by her family. Like, from what I can tell online, these kids seem to be very, very loved and seem to have very involved and attentive parents and grandparents and seemingly would have had very bright futures ahead of them. And they may still, but they're definitely going to have some problems that they have to work through all of, be all of because, all because their mother was stolen from them, allegedly by their own father. Now, trouble in paradise. What exactly started the slow deterioration of this relationship is unclear, but as of a year before she was killed, so that would have been 2022, maybe 2021, they were in marriage counseling. They were going to couples therapy, couples therapy, marriage counseling. They were in therapy to try to save their relationship. And if it did happen in 2022, 2021, and they got married in 2019, it means that they weren't married very long before the trouble began. And I mean, there are a lot of reasons that this could have happened. We don't know them, so we can't say for sure. I know that having kids is a very stressful thing that not a lot of people, and I feel like a lot of couples are prepared for the amount of stress that comes with that and the lack of, <sighs> what's the word I'm looking for here? The lack of patience for one another because you know you hit capacity pretty quick because you have other people who are using your patience and the lack of emotional availability between the two of them the lack of time that you can just like dedicate to your partner there's a lot of things it could have been but it also could have been that it wasn't relationship specific at all and it could have been a john specific problem because he could have been an anger or violent man and there is a little bit out there to suggest that this is true but it is very like, it's shaky, but I'll still tell you. So it's been reported that in looking up criminal records for the name John Wonder in the area that this John Wonder lives, so Kansas City, Missouri, there is a John Wonder listed as being born in 1992, which is the same as our John Wonder. Well, not my John Wonder, never my John Wonder, but the John Wonder that we're talking about now. But anyways, there is a record for a John Wonder who was born in 1992 and lives in Kansas City, Missouri, who had a protection order issued against him. Okay. And the order said that he was stalking his victim and was not allowed to own a firearm. Now it's totally possible that this isn't related at all. This is a totally different John Wonder and it's a giant coincidence to so take it with a grain of salt, but it was issued in 2019 and the timing seems to line up right. And it's something that's in the media. So it's worth mentioning, but again, it could be literally nothing because I don't think John Wonder is like a super common name, but Sometimes when you look for people on Facebook, which I did look for him on Facebook and I did find his Facebook, but there are more John Wonders in the world than you might think. So again, it could be nothing, but if it is something, that's something. <laughs> and also it would be pretty coincidental for it not to be related, especially considering what we're talking about here. Either way, <laughs> what we can say for sure is that the couple had been in couples counseling, but it hadn't been effective for them. So they had decided that they were going to split. They were going to get a divorce. And this was a divorce that John's mother was actually going to help the couple pay for because you know, that can be expensive and she was going to help them cover that expense. Now, despite the fact that the two were going to be getting divorced at the time of the murder, they were still living together, but they weren't going to be living together for much longer. That's because Ashley was in the process of moving out of the North Forest home that the couple had shared, which I believe the two had purchased together because from what I saw, I believe Ashley's mother is a real estate agent and helped them get into that home. But now she was leaving. She already had an apartment secured and had it set up and she was scheduled to move out of the home that they shared on October 1st, 2023, which was like a week after she was killed. And she had like a good support system for her too. You know, it's, it's so frustrating because she had people helping her, people who were making sure that she got on her feet. And her friend Irene said of this quote, she was going to move into an apartment this week. We all surrounded her with items that we didn't need anymore and pretty much furnished her apartment with that. But now it's over and at the hands of her own husband, even if he was going to be her ex-husband at the hands of the father of her kids, his kids. You know what I mean? Like, let's say that she truly was disposable to him, which is already horrific and disgusting in its own right. He didn't think about his kids. He didn't think about the trauma that his kids would go through. Even if he got away with this, which he didn't, even if he got away with this, they'd be dealing with the trauma of losing their mother. And now they're dealing with the trauma of losing both parents and growing up with the knowledge that their father allegedly 
killed their mother. Now let's go back and talk about that day, the day that Ashley was found and John disappeared. It started with John dropping his kids off at Ashley's parents' house. And apparently this was a totally normal occurrence for him. This is something that he did most days. So it was 8.20 in the morning when John came and dropped the kids off at his in-laws house. And normally he would get there, he'd get them out of the car, he'd walk them to the door, he'd bring them inside, you know, like a normal father would do. But on this day, John didn't do that. He literally dropped them off on the porch and he drove off. Now these are not teenagers, these are not older kids. This is a two-year-old and a four-year-old that you just abandoned on a porch and left. And I could only imagine what Ashley's parents were thinking and what they were like trying to figure out what was going on, but they didn't have a lot of time to put this together because 90 minutes later, the welfare check call came in. It was John's boss who actually called and reported that a welfare check needed to be issued because John didn't show up for work. And when he didn't show up for work, John's boss actually reached out to Ashley's supervisor to find out if she showed up. And when they found out, when they both found out that neither of them showed up, they were like, that's weird. This is very, quote, unusual behavior for this couple. And so, you know, police and the family go to the house and they find what I already told you that they find. I don't want to go through that again because it's just fucking sad. But while they're at the house, because they're there a while, other people start showing up. Other family members start showing up. And of these people was John Wonder's sister. Now she wasn't there to try to protect her brother, which good. We should not be protecting allegedly murderous siblings or family members, right? But she gets there and she shows police screenshots of the text message exchange between her and her brother, where he literally said like, sorry about the mess and said that committing an implied rather that committing a murder was a lot easier and more satisfying than you may think. While at the scene, his sister also tried to contact him again. She reached out, she tried to call him on the phone, but by this time he wasn't interested in having a conversation with her. So now this house is an active crime scene. We have police there searching the house. We have a tactical team going through the area, securing the area, because now this is an active crime scene. Like this is a homicide, this is a murder scene which was a shock, right? For this area, it was very shocking with one of the neighbors saying that this was just a totally ordinary place to live. And he said specifically, his name was Todd. Todd? Tom? Todd. Like Fox and the Hound. Todd said specifically of this quote, I was just out here last night thinking how quiet the neighborhood is. So whatever is going on here is pretty unusual. And pretty unusual is quite the understatement considering the impact it had on her family, a family who found her in the condition they found her in. Her mother was devastated, dude. In an instant, her daughter was gone, her son-in-law was gone, and her grandkids were parentless. And now she was the one who was going to be taking care of and raising these grandkids, which I'm sure she welcomed because she loved them so much. And it was, you know, I'm sure it wasn't a bad thing, but just imagine being in that situation. Imagine thinking the child raising years of your life were over and you were just ready for the, you know, spoiling and leaving. And now you're raising two kids while grieving the loss of your own. On September 24th, so two days after her daughter was found murdered and one day after her murderer was arrested, which we are going to get into, her mother made a Facebook post about what happened to her daughter, where she said, quote, this is a post no parent wants to make. Several of you have heard already or seen the news. Closest family and friends have been surrounding us. My heart is completely shattered. My daughter, Ashley Earhart Wonder, was senselessly murdered in her home Friday. She is the beautiful young woman that gave us our beloved grandbabies who are safe and in our care. I'm not able to share the details past that at this time for many reasons. I appreciate everyone that has reached out and I'm grateful that you continue to do so. This journey of losing a child in this way is going to be very long. Along with this, along with this post, she had posted a photo of Ashley and then a separate photo of Ashley's son. And she continued saying, quote, this little boy was told today that he will never see his mommy again. This is the mommy fountain that he has already created in her memory. We will make sure she is remembered in our home every single minute of every single day. So the investigation and the arrest, John did not get away, did not get away with this, did not get away with this for very long. He was arrested that same Friday, but before he was arrested, police started doing their investigation and in doing their investigation and looking into all the messages that John had been sending out that day, they were pretty much 100% sure that they were looking into the right person. 
Police were able to look at the messages that John had sent, and not just the ones that he sent to his sister, which arguably were damning enough in, in their own right, right? Or in its own right, since it was one message. But they were also able to look at messages that John had sent to a friend of his over Facebook. And when I tell you, I cannot imagine being on the receiving end of these messages. One message that John sent, or John allegedly sent, because again, he hasn't gone to trial. So one message that John allegedly sent to his friend was the first message that was sent out in relation to the murder, at least that has been reported thus far. And it was sent at 7.39 a.m. And it said, quote, still haven't cried, still feel nothing. No more anxiety, though. That's a plus. About an hour later, he reportedly wrote, quote, now depleted. In anger, I placed her gemstone set next to her body her third eye chakra, her moonstone, blah, blah, blah. A lot of good, they did ya, hun. Which that statement, a lot of good, they did ya, hun, is so, it has such just like, maybe this is just me, but when I read that, I felt like anger and rage and hate and kind of like he was mocking her. Did, did you get that or is this just me? I don't know, but it was gross. And he continued, he continued by sending his friend yet another message 12 minutes later that said, quote, Part of me wants to get drunk and watch Shawshank Redemption one last time. However, I think it's time for me to go. Goodbye, house. To which I say, don't taint Shawn Shawshank. Don't taint Shawshank Redemption with your bullshit, John. Because Shawshank Redemption is a great movie. These prints I have here, I actually have one from a scene in Shawshank that I've been thinking about hanging here. I've been considering switching these around a bit because I have like ten different movie ones that I could be putting up. But that's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is the fact that John sent those messages and is now at this point, presumably on the run, in his wife's rental car. But he wasn't done writing his friends, because more than an hour later, he sent another message that said, quote, I'm in the car. I have no doubt I will be caught today. I keep thinking about how she never screamed. Just took it like a champ. What a gal. To honor her, I will not go out by a gunshot, suicide by cop in parentheses but hopefully a similar fate as Ashley. And then his last message that he sent to his friend was at 10.30 that morning. And to me, it reads like a response. I wonder if his friend finally wrote him back at this point. But he said to his friend, quote, some small town in northern Missouri. I'm guessing they will be finding her body right about now. I started getting calls at 9.30. Now, I truly cannot imagine being this friend. I know that we feel like our friends are supposed to be ride or die, but there has to be a limit. Like, how do you feel comfortable saying all of this to your friend? I do not know. And I'm not saying that this friend is a bad friend. I'm just saying, can you even imagine this? And I guess he came out and he told the cops that like, he didn't get these messages right away. That's why he hadn't called police right away. He didn't get these messages right away because he had been at work and he wasn't one to, you know, peruse Facebook on company time. He was not a time thief, this man or this woman. I don't think it's been specified which, which this person was. But then to log on and see all this and have your friend send you a message that says, quote, hey bud, sorry to make you the receiver of this, but I have to share with someone. I'm about to throw my phone out the windows and will continue north to Fargo. I'm not trying to get away, just feel like driving far, far away. And I mean, I guess at least he apologized to his friend. I don't know. Anyways, as those texts suggested, he was on the run. So what it looks like happened is he went, he dropped the kids off at his in-laws house. He went back to the house, he switched cars and got into Ashley's car to drive off. Which, why did he do that? I don't know, because don't like rental cars have GPS monitoring on them? Isn't that a thing? Did he not know that's a thing? Am I wrong in thinking that's a thing? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that's a thing. But anyway, he headed out and we know that around 10.30 a.m. he was in a small town in Northern Missouri. And then after that, he was in the wind until about eight hours later. That Friday evening, John Wonder was arrested in a small town called Valentine, Nebraska. And it is a really small town. It has less than 3,000 people and it's near the border of South Dakota, which for reference, that's about 500 miles from where he lived in Kansas City, Missouri. And if you look at a map, because I did, the route does make sense because he could have gone to Nebraska or Kansas. Those are the two states that are closest to Kansas City. You know, obviously Kansas being close to Kansas City makes a lot of sense. But Kansas City, Missouri is a place. Kansas City, Kansas is a place. We're talking Kansas City, Missouri and Nebraska and Kansas were the closest states to Kansas City, Missouri. But I wonder if he was trying to flee or hoping to flee to Canada, because if you look at a map, he'd just have to go through either Montana or North Dakota. But who knows, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he really did just want to go on a very long drive. 
But yeah, Nebraska State Patrol in Cherry County located John when he was driving westbound and arrested him on suspicion of first degree murder and armed criminal action, both of which are felonies. So he's in jail and he's being held on a $1 million cash bond. And they gave him a bond, which seems kind of high. A million dollars is pretty high, but they do believe that it's pretty likely that if he was able to get out, he may not show up in court right? He may go on another long, long drive. And they believe that he is a danger to the community because it does seem clear based on the evidence we have that he's likely responsible. So remember, he was arrested in Nebraska and the last reporting on this case showed that he was in a jail in Nebraska awaiting extradition. There was no word on if he was going to be extradited or when. Well, he was, but when, and there was no record on if he had an attorney and there were no hearings scheduled for him. So we don't know anything now because there has been no reporting since then. The last thing they said was he's arrested in Nebraska and that's where he's chilling for now, which is just wild to me. Like, man, that was back in September. And this seems like the type of case that should be monitored and reported on and that actually what happened to her should be remembered and discussed and that the dangers of domestic violence should be looked at and talked about and seen as more serious, right? Like they should be reporting on that because this is a, like a very serious problem in the world right now and in the world for a while. Officer Elena Gonzalez, who was the spokesperson for the Kansas City Police Department, said that Ashley Earhart was murdered in a domestic violence incident, which makes total sense considering we know from history and past cases, and it's just general knowledge that the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when the abused person is trying to leave. And we know that Ashley was a week away from leaving John. Reportedly, according to World Population Review, Missouri has the third highest rate of people who have experienced domestic violence. It's been reported that 41.8 of Missouri women and 35.2% of Missouri men experience intimate partner violence, sexual violence, or stalking. And that just seems so incredibly high to me. And it's not just Missouri, it's, it's everywhere. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. And one in seven women are injured by an intimate partner. And I, I know that, right? But one in seven is just insane when you really think about it. I'm at the park. I'm on a bus. There are women around me and one or more of them have likely been a victim or, or are presently a victim of domestic violence. That's truly so sad. I cannot imagine being in that situation. And is that the situation that Ashley was in? Was she being abused and was trying to get away? Or was this a one-time serious fucking overreaction to the idea of losing her now? I really don't know. And wonder being written on her leg. What the fuck was that about? Because that's the thing that got me, right? That's the first thing that I read about this case, the thing in the headline that made me read further. And when I was first reading it, I thought that maybe she did that, that maybe she was able in her state after being attacked to write the name of the person who attacked her on her leg to try to help, you know, solve her own case. But in reading about this further and looking into, you know, how long she had been gone and how she was attacked, it seems much more likely that he wrote his own name on her body in blood. And why would he do that? That's one of the questions that I hope we get answers to if and when this case goes to trial. I hope that it happens soon. I hope that her family and her friends can get justice for her because it's just incredibly sad. And as her friend said, she is a loved and unbelievable person who is going to be missed very, very much. And with that, that my friends is the story so far of the tragic murder of Ashley Earhart. I hope that you found my telling of this to be informative. I hope it made sense. I know there isn't a lot of information, but I still felt compelled to talk about Ashley. And I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering her with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this, what do you think caused the murder of Ashley Earhart? Do you think that she was in an abusive relationship or do you think this was something that was totally out of the ordinary? Like, what do you think? And what do you, why do you think he wrote wonder on her leg, dude? Like I, that's the thing that I really can't get. And do you think it was him or do you think it could have been her? It's a lot of questions. It's one of those cases that leaves a lot of questions because we don't have a lot of information. So let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. 
Anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below with whatever case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases. Whenever you leave me a suggestion, I put it on the list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack. Become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And of course, if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.